Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's amazing to be at Codebeam Light. This is my first time in Stockholm. My first time attending Codebeam Light. Uh, thanks, Pierre. I feel like you have set up such <laughs> a background for some of the talk that I'm going to be um, speaking about. Uh, mine might not be as you know low level as is, uh, but I think it's a bit more relatable, a bit more practical, right? Um, so I'll be speaking on self-hosted Elixir. API is all you need. Um, and just a bit about myself, my name is Pelumi. I currently live and work in Dublin, Ireland, uh, where I work as a vice president, software engineering at Bank of America. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, I got into Elixir about three, four years ago. Um, so a very close friend of mine, Reed Warren, um, is basically addicted to all things Elixir, all things Elang, all things Beam, right? It's, it's one of those few people that you're like, oh, how did you discover this? And it's like, you know, I was in some corners of the internet and I found it out. And, you know, because we're close friends, you know, it sort of forced it on me. And then I was like, wow, okay, this is amazing. This is beautiful. And since then, I've also kind of been like a, a massive evangelist. Uh, coincidentally, uh, around uh, Christmas last year, 2024, um, he bought me a Christmas gift, and what he sent across was a Raspberry Pi. Um, so I got the Raspberry Pi, and I was thinking to myself, okay, what could I do with this, you know? Um, and I'm also someone who spends some time, a good amount of time, on Reddit. So, wait, before I do that. Uh, so he got me a Raspberry Pi 4, and this is just a high level of the specifications of the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, 1.8 gigahertz. Um, Act 64, similar to what we have on the Silicon Max. Uh, it came with about four gigabytes of RAM, um, internet, Wi-Fi, and then I had to custom install. So typically, when you get the Raspberry Pi, there is no OS on it, and then you know you load an OS onto it. A lot of people would load something visual, but I knew for sure that I didn't want to do anything visual, right? Um, so I loaded the Raspberry OS Lite onto it, which is just a, a terminal-based, you know, OS, right? Um, and so, yeah, and once I did that, I plugged it in. As you can see, I have a fancy enclosure. Um, so that's the Raspberry Pi plugged into my home uh, router. And yeah, it was up. So I asked myself, you know, what can I, what can I do with this? What am I interested in at the moment, right? And because I spent a bit of time on Reddit, I... I've been seeing a lot of stuff regarding like self-hosting stuff, right? Um, maybe, for example, like a lot of people were hosting a bunch of stuff on Vassel. Vassel made some changes and they got hit with like a massive bill. And everyone is really like, okay, do we really need to be, you know, paying so much stuff to, you know, all the hosting platforms? Um, I don't know what the answer is on that, right? But I was quite interested in a lot of the conversations that were going on our self-hosting. And then, of course, you know, the conversations that happen on our Elixir or Elixir forums. And so I thought to myself, you know, okay, maybe I should host an Elixir application, you know, from my house, self-hosted. And so I, I began the process of exploring how I could achieve this. Writing the Elixir code is a bit straightforward, right? Well, we all have a, you know, good deal of familiarity with what that entails. Um, but my biggest problem with Deploying that was number one, how do I actually route traffic? So if I expose it you know, to external users, how do I route incoming traffic to the Raspberry Pi, uh, which sits in my house you know, alongside you know, a bunch of other devices that exist in my household? That, that was the biggest concern. And then the second, second concern is I did not want the process of you know, making changes to whatever application I'm hosting on the Pi to be cumbersome, right? And then it to be as easy as if I was using one of the popular paid you know, hosting tools like Vassel or Netlify or Heroku. So that was also something that I needed to think about. Regarding my first problem, I'll call it service discovery in quotes, how you know, external people can find whatever you know, application I'm hosting. Um, a major challenge is um, this varies from country to country and from provider to provider. Uh, in Dublin, I use um, Virgin Media, I believe. And what they do is each household has just one IPv4 address. 
which typically is fixed, but they provide no guarantees around that, right? So they could rotate it if they choose to. Um, so it's fixed, which means in quotes, you know, I could be able to reach my household whenever I want. But the problem with that, obviously, is, you know, ports and security and firewall. And then, you know, if you're feeling risky, <laughs> you could probably want to go the, through the path of, you know, opening up some firewalls and then, you know, um, opening up some ports and the likes. But we all know that's, that's never the safe thing to do, right? So that was the an option. Um, my internet provider provides, you know, um, IPv6 addresses to each of the devices connected with, with, on my network, home network. So the, the Raspberry Pi did have an IPv6 address, right? Uh, which could be reached, right, externally from, you know. Uh, but the problem with that is that the IPv6 address um, is not guaranteed at all. It frequently changes. In fact, in between restarts, you know, your IPv6 will change. And on the average, from what I observed, you know, it typically has a least time of about two weeks. So after about two weeks, you know, they would even rotate the IPv6 address, right? So it was a good option, but I, I saw that, you know, this, this will require so much extra work to basically always make sure that, you know, whatever I'm hosting can always be easily reached, right? Um, I did a lot of exploration and I figured out um, this particular service. They are a less popular um, Cloudflare or Namecheap. They are called Dino, right? And the value proposition with Dino is Dino gives you the ability to dynamically update your, it gives you the ability to create an AAA record or four A's record, uh, which is, you know, pointing to an, a domain pointing to an IPv6 address. Um, and their value proposition is that you can constantly update programmatically, you know, the IPv6 address uh, that that domain points to um, using Dino, right? So, I explored this option and I thought I was home free. I thought, you know, wow, okay, I think I've figured this out, I've solved this problem. Until, you know, support by v 6 v6 is not universal. So I, I, I put something up and I sent it to some of my friends and I realized that some of my friends were able to access the service, right? But some of my other friends were not able to access the service. And I was kind of like confused, you know, what, why exactly is this happening? And I spent a lot of time trying to investigate this. I then realized that some internet providers, some ISPs would not allow you access an address that is only served over IPv6. So this was obviously disappointing because uh, I thought I was home free at this stage. Um, but that didn't work because, you know, I, I couldn't have a service that, you know, only, you know, whatever percentage of people uh, are able to access. So I did a little bit more research and, see it, and tried to find out what I could do. And this is when I discovered Cloudflare Tunnels. So I don't know how many people are familiar with Cloudflare Tunnels in the room. Uh, but this essentially, oh, you're familiar, awesome. Um, okay, I won't say what I want to say because that might be promotion, but this is fantastic work, right? Cloudflare Tunnels, fantastic work. Um, and how Cloudflare Tunnels work really is, I don't need to expose any pot on any device in my household. I don't need to open any firewall on the router. All I need to do is install a daemon on whichever device I want to be able to reach uh, from the external world. And so I install a Cloudflare daemon and what it does is uh, it establishes a, a, pers a lifelong uh, connection to Cloudflare servers. And it basically uses a keep alive strategy, right? To basically make sure that, you know, that connection remains open so that, you know, whenever anyone wants to reach that particular device uh, from the external world, you know, they're able to get it. Um, and then, you know, there were also other benefits like, which was, which was very important to me, right? Because when I looked at how the Cloudflare tunnel was working, a big value proposition within, you know, Elixir and Beam is, you know, the ability, for example, what we do with like Phoenix Live, what we do with like Phoenix Presence, is the ability to be able to um, send state changes to, you know, your server, to clients in real time. And, you know, we achieve this using WebSockets, right? So at first glance, when I looked at the solution, I thought maybe you might not be able to support, you know, using WebSockets, but fantastically, they actually do support it out of the box. And then, they also give me the ability to be able to use that same tunnel connection to SSH into the particular device. So this was, you know, ticking all boxes, right? And so Cloudflare Tunnel was the way for me to go to sort of expose the Raspberry Pi to the world. So I was happy I'd solved 
my first problem. The second problem I had was, you know, this was, this was a nice to have, right? I wanted to be able to make changes to whatever application I was running on the Pi, on the fly, and have those changes, you know, deployed, you know, to the uh, Pi, you know, easily, trivially, once I push the code to, you know, my code, hosting code repository. Um, and so I discovered Qualify. Qualify is an uh, open source solution that is similar to Vassel or Heroku. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Qualify in the room. Okay, one person. Also, an amazing tool, open source, fantastic. Um, it's similar to Vassel or Heroku. All of the features of functionality that you, you, know, you get with Vassel, where you, you know, connect your repository to it, you receive webhooks you know, when you know, changes happen to the repository, merges, and whatever. You know, that sort of smooth deployment flow, right? Um, it provides it open source out of the box. Um, and how Qualify really works is, you know, um, you can define using, you know, uh, Docker files or Docker Compose or Nix packs, you know, commands as to how it should build the application that you want to run. And then it uses Docker on the, you know, the device that you want to run it on to basically serve the application, right? In addition, it it also uses traffic and caddy um, to route incoming traffic, you know, based on the domains to that particular device. And the nice thing about Qualify is you don't have to spend too much time tweaking traffic or caddy, right? So it supports both, right? Whichever you want to use. You don't have to spend too much time tweaking it. Uh, just a bit of just a config, and then you know it sort of spins everything up and takes it uh, takes care of it for you, right? Which is an amazing DevOps workflow because a lot of times on the teams I work with, we do spend some time, you know. Maybe something happens with our traffic or our caddy, and you know, it's usually a lot of trouble trying to fix that and make sure that you know, our application can be discovered. It also integrates with Cloudflare, um, which was also good, considering that I decided to go the Cloudflare tunnel route to expose the application. And yeah, it's open source. At least it's open source for now. So this is a really small image. Uh, but this is Andreas, the creator of Qualify. And you know, it just had this joke where Google you know, reached out to him. So we're hoping Google doesn't buy them, because if they buy them, you know, the community is going to lose a, a, a great resource. And yeah, so let me introduce a new stack, uh, Qualify Raspberry Pi Cloudflare Beam CRCV Flames. I, I don't know if that's going to get popular, but you know, uh, that's what I've come up with. Um, for the final thing I'll do today, OK, sorry, I should have uh, one more slide, yes. So, I've, pre I've prepared a demo um, or of a Phoenix application that I'm running. So if you feel up to it, if you just want to take your phone out and go to the page on this, um, it will bring you to a particular to bring you to a particular site. And when you land on the site, okay, uh, let me see. Let me do this. OK, so what I've just done here is to simulate that, you know, um, a device as small as the Pi running um, a Beam-based application like Elixir, right, is capable of achieving so much that in the, in, you know, in the world that is not familiar with the Beam today, they expend so much cost and so much effort to establish, right? We're all familiar with Sasa Jurek's uh, uh, comparison about you know, the Redis cache and then you know, message passing and queues and all of that that we sort of have for class support within Beam, right? So what I've done here is, uh, this is a Phoenix Live V app. Forgive me the styling, right? I, I, working with CSS is the most difficult thing for me, right? I've just put some stuff on the screen. And um, to simulate you know, a sort of artificial load, you can put in you know, the amount of tabs you want. Now, it's possible that your device might pull up a pop-up to you know, say, oh, you know, it doesn't want you to put this amount of tabs or whatever. Just allow it, right? So you can simulate anything between 1 to 1,000, depending on how quickly your device can open all of that. So for me, I would just say, let me simulate 10. OK, so I've just opened you know, 10, um, 10 tabs right, that are essentially connected to some states on the server running on the Pi. And I will just pull this up so you can see this. Uh, I'm going to update that state in real time. Uh, 
And this is, these changes are being propagated trivially across all of us who are connected right now, and you're seeing the changes, right? And if I opened up the, which I could do time, if I opened up the, you know, the, the pie, uh, and, you know, we looked at the, you know, the, 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 the processes, right, the computes, it's barely breaking the sweat. This is one of the, you know, many advantages and the power of the beam. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Um, in terms of, so my last slide, major benefits, right? Cost, cost is the major benefits. Um, all its cost uh, for this pie was about $100 for the pie, which I didn't even pay myself, was a gift. Electricity cost tries to zero, you know, the pie is famous for low power consumption. Internet cost also zero, because, you know, whether I had the pie or whether I was self-hosting or not, I would still have to pay for my internet subscription. And then, you know, of course, control, right? So I, I control everything from top to bottom, in a sense, right? It's not, it's not somebody else's computer. Now, what are the sort of, you know, disadvantages or the issues or where this might not, you know, be uh, a nice option for you to play with, right? Um, if you were doing something that was doing significant compute, right, this might not be an option for you because, you know, the Pi is not known for, like, being um, very powerful in terms of compute. Um, but I, I would go out on a limb and say that most of the stuff that we build within the community are not usually very compute heavy. So I don't think that's going to be too much of a disadvantage. And of course, if you wanted to have, like, uh, global resiliency, right, or uh, something distributed ac across the globe, obviously, a self-hosted solution would not be, you know, would not be an option for you. And then uh, if you care about people snooping, uh, you definitely can use this because Cloudflare goes through everything um, as it's passing through their tunnels, as you'd imagine. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, that's how self-hosted Elixir. Uh, thank you. <laughs>